Hi friends, it's Miss Marcy. I'm back with some fun science activities today that we can do with balloons, okay? So, hopefully you have some balloons laying around the house. Um, and balloons are so much fun to play with no matter what, right? It's great to be able to inflate them, fill them with air, and then deflate them, let the air come out. But today, we're gonna try to inflate our balloons in some different and unique ways using a little kitchen chemistry. The first thing you're gonna need is a balloon, and you will also need an empty water bottle, okay? So I'm sure we can find one of these. It doesn't have to be a water bottle. It doesn't matter what was in here before. If there's anything left in there, you may wanna rinse it out. We're gonna get ourselves some baking soda and some vinegar. I happen to have white vinegar, but this would work with any kind of vinegar that you have in the house. If you have some red vinegar that you might use for salad dressings or even some apple cider vinegar, it should be fine. So the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna take your balloon and you're gonna stretch it out. Just get it ready for the experiment, okay? And you're gonna take a funnel if you have one, okay? If you don't have a funnel, a spoon will work just fine. But I happen to have a funnel, and what's great about a funnel is it has a wide mouth and a tiny bottom, so when you're adding large amounts of things into a small place and you can't figure out how you would pour that large amount into such a tiny opening, aha, a funnel is a wonderful tool that will do that trick for you. So you take the end of the funnel and you insert it into the balloon. And then we're going to add, actually I'm gonna use a different funnel. We're gonna add our baking soda into the balloon, okay? So I'm pouring a little bit of baking soda from the box and I have to sort of shake it to get it in there. It's a little bit lumpy. Just shaking it until I get it all the way in to fill up my balloon. Now by the way, Filling up balloons with baking soda or flour or sugar are a wonderful way to make little squishy toys, which are kind of fun to have. Just make sure they're really tied very well um, and uh, they're fun to play with. All right, I'm gonna pause the video for a second while I get my balloon filled. It's not cooperating with me and I don't want you to have to wait too long. So hold on one second. Okay, I'm back. And as you can see, my balloon here is squishy and filled with the baking soda. I actually found it was helpful to use a spoon into the funnel to get it all filled up. Okay, I'm gonna take my balloon off now. I'm not gonna tie it. I'm gonna put it down for a moment and I'm gonna get one of my empty water bottles. And this time I'm gonna use my funnel to add some of the vinegar to the water bottle, okay? Use about a cup of vinegar. I just sort of approximated there. And that poured very nicely in through the funnel. Mmm, smells like salad dressing. Okay, now's the fun. We are going to take the balloon and we are going to fit it over the top of the water bottle. And once we do that and the balloon is turned upside down, what do you think is gonna happen? That's right. The baking soda is gonna come out of the balloon and enter the bottle where it's gonna meet the vinegar. Any predictions? Hmm, well, let's see. We are actually going to have a chemical reaction. Remember, a chemical reaction is a change. Something is gonna change and this is gonna be pretty exciting. The reason we're gonna have a chemical reaction is because the ingredients that we're using in this experiment are opposites. We have vinegar and we have baking soda. The vinegar is a type of chemical ingredient called an acid. An acid. Now, some acids are very, very strong and very dangerous. They're used for cleaning, they're used for construction, they're used in labs to do experiments. 
those acids we would never ever touch. Those acids can actually hurt you. They can burn through fabric and they can cut your skin and that would be very dangerous. We would never use those at all unless we were working in a place that required them and we had all the proper protective equipment, goggles and gloves and, and uniforms that protected us against the dangerous um, types of acid. However, vinegar is an acid and it's a very weak acid. It's not super powerful at all. It has a very low, um, what we call a, a pH on the acids base scale. So vinegar is super weak. It's not going to hurt us. Um, so you do not need to wear gloves or a mask when you use it. The smell will so smell pretty acidic, but it will not hurt us at all. The opposite of vinegar, which is an acid, is something called a base. Baking soda is a base. It is very plain, it is very neutral, there's nothing in it that could hurt you. It's not something we eat, certainly. It tastes yucky, I mean, if you tried it, it tastes a little bit salty. We use it um, in a lot of baking recipes because it helps our dough or whatever we're making be a little more fluffier and, and taste better. Um, but as I said, it is the opposite of vinegar. Baking soda is the base and vinegar is an acid. Hi there. I wanted to come back and talk to you a little bit about something that I had said a few minutes ago called the pH scale. This is a scale that has been created by scientists to measure how much acid is in a certain item or how alkaline the item is. Alkalinity or alkaline is just a fancy scientific word for a base, okay? So this is just a cool chart and it's called the pH scale and it measures the amount of hydrogen which is a type of atom in different um, chemicals to see where they fall on the scale. So I thought this was kind of interesting. Um, if we start all the way at the bottom in the red, that's the most powerful acids. So um, the f first one that comes in at number one is something called gastric acid. You know where that is? You could find that in your tummy. That's the kind of acid in our tummies that breaks down all the food that we eat while we're digesting it. So that's pretty powerful and that's inside us. Then we've got lemon juice, and then when you move up and you have orange juice, then tomato juice, and then even black coffee. Now when we get right to the middle to number seven, I'll hold this up a little bit closer so you guys can see that, sorry. When we get right to the middle to number seven, we're right in the middle between the acids and the bases. So now we're, number seven is water. So it's water we know is not an acid or a base. It's very plain, very neutral, right in the middle. And then we start moving up a little more to ocean water and then the baking soda that we talked about. And then um, something called milk of magnesia, which is what you actually take when you have a tummy ache. It's something that you can take to make your gastric acid feel a little bit better. Um, and then there's some cleaning solutions like ammonia for cleaning, and then even soapy water, and finally bleach, which we know is a pretty strong chemical for cleaning. So that's the pH scale that I mentioned. It goes from the acids all the way up to the bases. I thought that was kind of cool to share. And you can find this on the internet and print it out and experiment with it at home, supervised, of course. Um, anyway, so what happens when an acid and a base, which are two very opposite things as we see, come together? Well, they have a reaction because as we said, they are very different. So let's see what's about to happen. We have our acidic vinegar and we have our balloon filled with our baking soda. I am going to put the balloon on the top, okay? And then I'm gonna hold it up because I want you to be able to see it. Now the baking soda has not entered the vinegar yet. 
okay? It has not gotten mixed with the vinegar until I lift it up and let it do so. Any predictions on what might happen when the acid and the base meet? Let's see. Whoa, look at that. What an awesome way to blow up a balloon. The acid and the base met and they had a chemical reaction. And in that reaction, there was a change. Something came out of that reaction. And what came out of it was a gas. So what happened was when the baking soda and the vinegar um, came together, they created something called carbonic acid, another type of acid. And that acid quickly dissolved and it turned into this gas that we call carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is the gas that we breathe out, the waste gas for humans, but it's the gas that the trees and the plants love. So we trade that back and forth. They give us our oxygen and we give them our carbon dioxide. But that carbon dioxide that was created from the carbonic acid that was created from the baking soda mixing with the vinegar, the acid and the base is what was used to blow up the balloon. Pretty cool, huh? Now I'm going to put this aside and we're going to see what happens over time. I'm going to move into our next experiment and see, will the balloon stay inflated? Will the carbon dioxide gas remain in there? Or after a while, will it get used up? I'm not sure. It'll be so fun to see if it lasts and if so, how long. So I'll put this to the side and I'm going to get a new bottle for our next part of the experiment. We're going to blow up another balloon, but this time with a totally different chemical experiment. For this, we are going to take some yeast, okay? Hopefully you have some yeast at home. I'm sure a lot of you have been doing um, some really fun baking activities, although I am hearing it's hard to find yeast in the supermarket these days. I'm so sorry. I just heard about that this morning, um, but hopefully you have some. If not, you can certainly enjoy my experiment and try this again when yeast becomes easier to find. Now, what is yeast? Did you know the little organisms in this packet are actually alive? Yep, they are actually alive. Yeast is a little microscopic, meaning you can't see it with your regular naked eyes. You'd have to use a powerful microscope. It's a microscopic fungi, a little fungus organism, okay? Now, when you buy it at the supermarket, it's fast asleep. It stays in these pass packets and it's not active, it's sleeping. Now, why do we use yeast? We use it a lot when we bake, we use it, um, for making bread and a lot of us did not use it last week because it was Passover and we know that yeast makes things rise up, right? And we don't do that on, in our Passover cooking. So we are going to see how the yeast can make our balloon inflate or rise up. So in order to do this, we need some warm water. So I'm gonna go heat up some water in the microwave and I'll be right back. Okay, I'm back. So I've got my warm water, because remember, the yeast is fast asleep. So now we've gotta wake it up. And so we're gonna add it using our funnel. We're gonna add our water first to um, the bottom of our next water bottle. So we're adding some warm water in here and this will help wake our yeast up, okay? Um, as it dissolves in the water, it's gonna become active, right? It's gonna wake up. It's microscopic, so you're not gonna see it. It's not like it's gonna start swimming or doing anything exciting like that. Um, but it will wake up. So I'm gonna add some yeast in here. And I'm gonna swirl my bottle around to let the yeast dissolve. Now, the yeast needs some energy, it needs some food in order to do its work, right? Because it is a living organism and it needs to eat. So, hmm, what do we add into a lot of our 
baking recipes that gives us energy, probably too much energy sometimes, but also would give great energy to our yeast. We add sugar. So let's give our yeast something good to eat. We'll give it some sugar. Okay, probably should have used my funnel. I just spilled sugar all over the floor. Okay, so we've got some sugar in there and we've got our yeast. And I'm gonna put the lid back on and just really give it a good shake so that my yeast is dissolved. And now it's got some sugar to eat, okay? And then the final step is we're going to take a balloon that has not been inflated, it is not filled with air, and we're gonna put it over the top of the yeast bottle. Now, we are gonna have to wait about 20 minutes for this. And they also suggest, it's also suggested that you put the bottle in a warm place, okay? So I am going to pause this in a minute and I'm gonna go put the bottle in a warm place and then I'm gonna wait for something to happen and then I will come back to you with the results and the rest of the lesson. But before I do that, let's check back on our carbon dioxide filled balloon. Still going strong, it has not deflated at all. And then I wanna show you one more project that I'm also working on. Um, this is a jar of, can you see these little guys? These are little caterpillars, little caterpillars. Do you know what these bells, oh, can you see that one moving? Usually they don't move too much. Um, do you know what these caterpillars are going to turn into? They are, of course, going to become butterflies. I just ordered them the other day, and they just arrived in my mailbox in this cup. Now, this cup doesn't look so important, but actually this brown stuff at the bottom of the cup is full of food for our caterpillars. Just like the book, The Very Hungry Caterpillar, these guys have to eat, 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 and they have to grow, 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 grow before they're ready to enter the next stage of their life cycle. So we are gonna keep an eye on these guys. I'll show them to you every week. So far, they're not doing much. They're still pretty tiny, um, maybe about an inch long, each of them, but they do appear to be eating and having a good time. And so I'm keeping them nice and safe and we will check on them next week and see how much they've grown and whether they're ready to start to move on to the next phase of their life cycle. And next week we can read a book about their life cycle, okay? All right, I'll be back in a few minutes with some action on our yeast jar, hopefully. I'm back, it's been 20 minutes and I have some very interesting results to show you. So I actually did it two separate times. And as you will see, the balloon inflated this time, but it did not inflate this time. So what was the difference? Well, I'll tell you. For this bottle, I used very hot water. Not boiling, but super hot. I had taken water and I put it in the microwave to heat it up. And I think that I heated it up too much and it made the yeast not be able to be alive. It probably was too hot for them and they were not able to come to life properly. For this bottle where it did work, where the balloon did inflate, um, I just used warm water that I got from the sink. And so that was a, allowed, that was just the right temperature that allowed the yeast to come alive and to eat the sugar. So that I thought was very interesting. If you look at the two bottles, you can see a very big difference in what the yeast were doing in the bottle, right? So what exactly did happen? Well, when the yeast were eating the sugar, they released a gas called carbon dioxide, the same gas that blew up this balloon, although this one was a little more dramatic. Um, the gas filled up our bottle and then it filled the balloon and inflated it right now let's talk a little bit about what yeast does in bread so when you're making bread you put yeast in the recipe with the flour and the sugar right and you mix it up and what that yeast is doing 
is it's making tiny gas bubbles as it eats the sugar, and it's putting millions of bubbles or those little holes that you see in our bread before it gets baked. And then once you bake the bread in the oven, the yeast itself dies and it leaves all those fun little holes. So that's how the gas, the carbon dioxide gas that the yeast makes when eating the sugar in our bread recipes turns into little holes in the bread that we eat. Pretty cool, huh? So what I showed you here today, these are technically just called demonstrations. They are not officially scientific experiments until you, the scientist, make them into one. How can you do that? You have to create a true experiment by doing it several times and changing things. What happens if you just keep your yeast bottle at room temperature? and not in a warm place? What happens if you put it in a cold place, like in the refrigerator? What if you use a smaller bottle than a water bottle? What if you use a larger bottle than a water bottle? Um, how much water should you put in? How little water could you put in? Could you feed the yeast different things? We fed it sugar, but does yeast like to eat honey? or syrup, other sweet things. So you guys can try these demonstrations over and over and by varying or changing different parts of it, you can create your own amazing scientific experiments. And I look forward to hearing all about them. Send me an email, marcylevinejacobs at gmail.com or shoot me a text, 917-626. 4224. Have lots of fun experimenting this week and finding out how to blow balloons up in much more interesting scientific ways. Take care, everybody. Be well and safe. Bye.